Hello, everyone. This is John MacArthur. I'm here in the Wikibon offices. Today is uh, is Tuesday, January 22nd, and I'm here with uh, my uh, with, with the uh, founder of Wikibon, Dave Vellante. Good afternoon, John. How you doing? Hi, everybody. Uh, good, to, uh, good to see you. Um, we are uh, live streaming live today. Live streaming today on Silicon Angle TV. Just uh, a quick reminder to everyone, or instructions to everyone, uh, please press star six to mute your line uh, now. We'll wait for a second for everyone to do that, but press star six to mute your line. And then when you're, if you have questions uh, later during the call, you can press star six to unmute so that you can uh, ask questions of our uh, guests or anyone in the, uh, any of the analysts today. So the title of today's uh, Pure Insight is Commercial Applications and Hyperscale Storage. We've covered the topic of hyperscale storage a few times here on, on Wikibon. We've had uh, guests from Shutterfly, and we've had uh, a CTO from uh, Cleversafe. Today we're uh, joined by Vice President uh, Russ Kennedy. Um, uh, Russ, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, John. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us today. Russ, as we, kick the, as we kick this off, um, I'd like you to talk, because we've talked about uh, sort of government applications where hyperscale storage matters, and we've talked about, um, we have talked about um, some of the new applications like Shutterfly. We've talked to them about uh, their use of, of, of uh, sort of hyperscale storage. Um, I want you to give us an update on what's, what you see, what's going on, Maybe first of all, with the kinds of accounts that are that are uh, dealing with these issues, and then and then a little bit about where you see it happening in the future. Sure. So first of all, thanks for the opportunity to join you today. I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, where we see you know, sort of the trends in the market and, and, and things driving you know the need for hyperscale. I think a lot of it's around you know, consumers and consumer devices. As you know, you know today. Everybody has, or a lot of people have, smart devices on their person. They can take a lot of pictures, take video, et cetera, et cetera, capture information. And then, you know, services like uh, like Facebook and Shutterfly and others, you know, they're they're around to help people share those images and those pictures and and that audio content with their friends and and, and other folks. So th those organizations are well. Uh, yeah understanding sort of the hyperscale kind of problem because they're dealing with that amount of data and they're dealing with that you know that uh, that sort of use case the you know the general population developing their own content wanting to distribute or share that content with others uh, you know so that's that's sort of driving that world as you mentioned in your intro you know the, 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 there's a there's a number of organizations particularly in governments that are they're that capturing a lot of that uh, you know that kind of data as well you know video surveillance, satellite imagery, uh, scientific information, you know, weather information, those kinds of things are, are, are being captured. And that's, that's sort of driving hyperscale storage in those organizations. But you know, I think the really interesting question that, that comes to mind is, is you know, how is the rest of the world sort of going to uh, deal with this as it, as it comes online? And I think, you know, again, some of the drivers of that are going to be individuals and humans wanting to, uh, in an enterprise or in a, in a, you know, in a standard working environment, you know, share information, uh, you know, not necessarily in email form or text form, but share it in video form or share it in audio form. And, and a lot of that's going to drive, I think, sort of the, you know, the proliferation of storage, but just like it's doing in the, in the consumer space today, in the enterprise world. And, and as, as Point where they uh, they want to offer services to their employees to collaborate and share information and, and, and particularly to share information in video format or image format. I think it's just going to drive uh, you know, hyperscale storage in those arenas. Thanks, Russ. Uh, just a reminder to anyone who's not speaking: please press star six now to mute your line if you haven't already muted it. Thanks. Um, so, within Within commercial uh, applications, uh, commercial businesses, is it when you talk about video content? Is I mean, is that maybe the uh, one of the best examples, or is it other kinds of content also that's driving the massive capacity growth? Well, you know, I think anything that, that's 
that where employees are going to collaborate on, you know, a, a work project or, or things that they're building or a new product or a new service, you know, those kinds of things are going to drive a lot of interaction. They're going to drive a lot of uh, creation, uh, content creation, uh, you know, design creation, et cetera, et cetera. And that's obviously going to generate a lot of di digital information. And, and, you know, these, these organizations are now looking for ways to get, uh, you know, people around the globe perhaps to collaborate or work together on, you know, the same piece of data or the same piece of, of information. So, you know, as, as, you, as you grow and you scale and you look at, you know, the, the size and the complexity of, of these environments, you got to consider the fact that, you know, data is going to be created in a lot of different formats and it's going to want to be distributed, shared, uh, updated, used, et cetera, uh, by a number of different uh, entities within an organization. I mean, I, I think that's what's driving a lot of the private cloud initiatives today are, you know, the fact that organizations want to uh, not only lower costs but add more services to their internal employees to say, you know, you can, you can now work with, you know, let's say people around the world on a particular project and collaborate and share information in a, in a, in a cloud that we're managing and, and we're maintaining for you. It, 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 you know, it certainly gives security, it certainly gives uh, advantages around, uh, you know, privacy and security versus a, a public cloud offering like, a, you know, like an Amazon or something along those lines. But I, I think more and more large enterprises and even emerging enterprises are going to start to take advantage of technology. Uh, and, and, and offer more services internally to their employees to do more online collaboration. Dave just got back from a conference on the on the West Coast, um, where there was a lot of discussion regarding hyper hyper hyperscale storage or hyperscale storage requirements. Um, yeah, actually, I wasn't there. I was watching the, okay. the live stream, but uh, David Floyer was there. I think David Floyer is in the call. Uh, John Furrier was there. Uh, and it was struck me as quite interesting in terms of the differences between hyperscale and traditional enterprises. Uh, maybe, maybe it's worth talking about that a little bit, but, but let me just uh, talk about some of the things that I learned just from watching the stream. For those of you who don't know, the Open Compute Platform uh, Summit, OCP Summit, is really sponsored by Facebook. It's, it's Facebook's, essentially Facebook's reference architecture for how they build out infrastructure. And, you know, it's, Facebook spends a billion dollars a year on capital equipment for its infrastructure. <laughs> it's a nice budget. And um, essentially, if you look at the hyperscale market, I just these are some of the things that I came up with there. They tend to be very early adopters. Uh, they deploy what I would say either are purpose-built um, servers or maybe they're even custom servers that are built by ODMs that, that are specific to hyperscale uh, and, and, and similar approaches to storage. Uh, there's obviously the scale out. Uh, there's a lot of read only going on, or, or read heavy going on, and they do do a lot of cheap and deep. I mean, it's cheap SATA, even less expensive SAS, even less expensive uh, SSD. Whereas if you contrast that with the enterprise, it's, it's kind of the fat middle to late majority. You know, they let the OEMs do the qualifying for them. It's it's IBM and EMC and NetApp and Dell that are doing the qualifications, and, and they're using commercial off the shelf components from the likes of those companies or HP or Dell or maybe even sometimes ODMs, a much right heavier environment and um, they're using the higher end blend of, of whether it's, you know, spinning disk or, or SSD. And, and I guess the, the, the big difference that I see, and I wonder if, if people would comment on this, is that it's, it's really the hyperscale guys are software led. I mean, they're really putting software function, layering software as services on top of that commodity infrastructure, whereas today in the enterprise, there's a lot of function embedded into arrays, uh, for example. And uh, that sort of was my takeaways from the OCP summit. I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts or comments there, or Russ. Yeah, so, so I, I think you, know, you, you certainly laid it out very well uh, you know, in terms of in terms of what companies like Facebook are, are looking to do, I mean, they, they, they obviously have huge challenges from an infrastructure perspective, and they have huge challenges from a growth perspective, and, and they're looking for solutions that can, you know, can, can, can deliver value and can deliver capability you know, at, a, at a cost point that makes sense for their business, at a cost point that makes sense for, you know, their need to scale out and to scale up and to, and to grow and be able to, you know, manage the, the the data and the infrastructure that they have to manage to deliver the services to their customers. So they're certainly well aware of those challenges and they, and they definitely are looking at 
uh, you know, things like open compute and, and other commodity-oriented uh, technologies to, to kind of help drive some of that. And, and there are other companies that are that are certainly, uh, you know, at that or at similar scales and, and need to grow at, at, at similar rates. So I, I think that's that's very appropriate. As you said, most of the enterprises, however, are you know a little bit behind that in terms of you know what they're looking at or what they're what they may be buying these days, they may be going more for a traditional approach or a traditional vendor approach uh, versus something that's open or, or uh, you know, promoted as an open platform. Uh, that being said, I think they're going to eventually run into the same challenges as, as we were talking about. As more and more content is being generated in an enterprise and being uh, generated to be shared or to be used in a collaborative manner across an enterprise, I think they're going to run into similar types of challenges that you know the the big guys, the big uh, uh, you know the big uh, Web 2.0 or social media companies have, have have already started to tackle, and they're going to be looking for similar types of solutions that are you know, they're, they're they're easily scaled out. They they allow them to add you know software and services and, and capabilities on top of a core hardware platform. That they can they can build out and, and, and deliver on a very rapid and an easy to deploy scale and, and be able to handle the challenges and grow challenges that are that are coming down the road. So I, I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be a little bit of time before you know the, the traditional enterprises are, are at that point, but I think they're going that way. Okay, so your premise is that these guys, the scale out guys, are a harbinger to what's coming in the future, and you said it's a little bit of time. What, how much time do you think? Yeah, are we five to ten years away from that, or is it sooner? I think it's a, you know it's it's probably a couple of years away, but not much more than a couple of years away. I mean, if you just look at the you know what, what's projected in terms of growth rate, and what's really driving the growth. I mean, it, I mean, you look at you know if you look at the growth today. It's 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 all around you know these large unstructured objects. It's all around you know images. It's all around video. It's all around audio. It's all around you know, that kind of data. That's what's driving it. And enterprises are going to latch onto that and start to build those kinds of services internally for their. For their customer, for their in internal customers, for their users. Uh, the other thing that I think is going to drive this a lot is the whole analytics uh, angle and, and, and the ability or the need for enterprises to now start to uh, analyze the information that they're capturing or analyze the information that's that's out there and available uh, for driving, you know, more competitive advantage, for driving new product introductions, for understanding market trends. You know, for, for looking at where are new business opportunities that they could launch, you know, all those kinds of things that are going to help enterprises become more competitive in their space. They're going to look at, at, at ways to capture information and then be able to analyze that information. And certainly the platform that they're going to be uh, looking for is something that's flexible, something that's scalable, something that you can, you can not only capture data and, and, and store data in, but you can also analyze data as, you, as you're doing that in real time and over time. Can we talk a little bit about the can we talk a little bit about the breaking points so uh, uh, an organization might be going along just fine meeting their needs growth rate they can manage their growth rates and then at some point it's kind of like the I'm all prepared for the nine foot uh, uh, tidal wave but then the 12 foot wave comes and I flooded half of uh, Manhattan or something like that sure. what are the breaking points as it relates to st storing large repositories of, of of objects, unstructured objects. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a you know that's an interesting question. I think it's it, 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 it's different for different industries. I think it's different for different organizations. But you know, typically when you look at you know, where customers are today, you know, most of these large organizations are, are looking at petabytes, you know, tens of petabytes, hundreds of petabytes, perhaps. And in the case of you know the, the big companies we've talked about, even you know exabytes or tens of exabytes of information that they're that they're storing and managing. So. That where's the breaking point? You know, it, it's probably around a petabyte or a few petabytes in terms of what can you can you realistically, uh, you know, store, manage, protect, uh, make available, uh, and, and do so in a, in a in a cost-effective manner. I mean, you can you can get there. You can get there through brute force methods. You can get there through replication. You can get there through, you know, uh, a backup or a backup infrastructure that protects information. But but at some point in time. It gets it gets to a point where if you're let's say making you know three replicas or three copies of your data, uh, at some time at some point in time spending you know three x the amount of storage to first house the data and protect the data and power and cool the storage and then manage it, you know there, there there's a financial breaking point 
in addition to a technical breaking point. And, and you know, when we engage with customers, it's, it's generally around the you know the, the one or two petabyte range where, where that starts to get a little bit difficult. Certainly, if you get you know at, at a ten petabyte range, it's it, it, it's starting to get very very difficult and very costly. And that's why I think customers are looking for alternatives to you know the traditional storage approaches that can that can deliver you know cost effective, reliable, secure storage options for their for their data. So, so there's the aspect of replication, which is how a lot of people deal with availability, and and uh, and then there's the issue of backup. Uh, can uh, can uh, backup and can replication be el completely eliminated in these kinds of environments? Well, I think at some point you have to look at does it make economic sense to replicate data, you know, three times or four times in order to ensure that it's available. Uh, you know, it, certainly at, at, at tens of petabytes, that's a lot of storage that you're buying and powering and, and you know, cooling and managing. If it's online, if it's spinning, if you put it on tape, you know, you, you, you certainly address the, you know, some of the power issues, but maybe your data is not as, as readily available. So you gotta, you got to make that trade up. I think there are levels, and, and I think it's probably in the 10 petabyte range that, that you can say, does it make sense to replicate to protect this data, or does it make sense to back it up? And even so, you know, what is my backup philosophy? Do I have to back everything up? Do I have to only back up the things that change? How often do I need to, to do backups? What are my objectives of backup? Is it to recover to a certain point in time, or is it just to, to ensure that the, the data is protected and available? And I think what you're starting to see is, is, is organizations at that level, certainly with unstructured data, are looking at different ways to to store and manage that data, keep it online and keep it available in more of a you know an archiving type of use case or methodology that that uses different you know approaches to protect the data and different approaches to make make sure that the data is available. David uh, um, Floyer on the phone. I think you had a question. You wanted to? Yeah, no, I had a, a, a comment, um, which is that the, uh, the the whole business model uh, of hyperscale is very different. Um, it's designing, putting in the minimum amount of equipment uh, up front and minimizing the amount of maintenance that's required uh, both by the vendors and by the installation. So you're trying to, if something fails, for example, in Facebook, they just turn it off. Um, if uh, enough uh, servers or components fail, then they turn off the rack and after three years they replace it anyway um, because it'll be a lower cost to do that than to try and extend the life and um you know that uh, that that model of of looking at things on putting in much more uh, cost up front is something obviously that large-scale enterprises and but in the shorter term uh, that uh, cloud providers will have to uh, embrace uh, if they're going to compete with the likes of Amazon or, 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 or Google or, uh, or Microsoft for the, these types of services. Sure. So um, it, my question is, uh, is to what extent uh, are you providing uh, your, your, your products in that open source, open, in, uh, you know, uh, multi-vendor uh, Type of environment um, that uh, that's been created. Uh, so I, 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 you kind of broke up there at the end. I'm not sure I understood your your question, but but I think there's a couple of comments relative to the topic that we're that we're discussing. One one I think your your, your point about the fact that you know hardware commodity commodity oriented hardware you know at hyperscale is certainly something that that people look at. You know maybe not investing as, as much in the hardware, certainly investing in software capabilities that can, that can uh, deliver levels of reliability and availability of the data, but not necessarily have to have the significant investment in the hardware. At your point of, you know, if something fails at a, at a certain rate or a certain level, you just replace it with, you know, with similar components or, or uh, commodity components. and. And you know the data is is now readily available or, or replicated to that new componentry, and it's now available. 
you know, that, that's certainly a, 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 a viable approach at hyperscale, and, and I think you, you know, most companies that are at that scale are, are, are now definitely looking at that. So that's a, that's a difference in terms of backup or traditional approaches versus a, a hyperscale approach. But the key to that is you have to have a, a way of treating the data, a way of managing the data to ensure that it is reliable and ensure that it is available and ensure that if something fails, you know, the data can, uh, the system can detect that there is a failure and it can recover from that failure. Uh, you know, it, it, when, when we talk about that with customers, we talk about the benefits of our dispersal mechanisms and erasure coding as a, a viable method at hyperscale to be able to ensure that the data is protected and the data is available should there be a hardware failure, should there be a component failure. And that's really what you're, what you're trying to guard against. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, at hyperscale, that, that, that model certainly works, and as organizations, enterprises particularly, start to get to that level and start to get to that scale, they're going to want to look to those new models and you know the, the new commodity-oriented hardware models with a software layer or a set of software that can ensure that the data is reliable, the data is available, the data is protected, uh, so they can, they can spend less or invest less in the hardware or be able to replace the hardware if it fails very rapidly. And yet the data is still protected, the data is still available. One of the things that we're seeing, Russ, is that there's, there are these growing repositories of data, but then there are also these growing repositories of metadata. Um, and, and when you combine the data and the metadata, you end up with different use cases with different uh, performance requirements. And one of the things I'm interested with the approach that you use there at CleverSafe is can the data dispersal ap approach, the erasure encoding approach, serve up the data um, at the rates that you need for all the use cases? I'll, 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 yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a very good point. And, 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 and as you're dealing with you know, billions of objects or trillions of objects, uh, metadata becomes very critical in being able to uh, identify pieces of information, being able to categorize that information, search it, find it, that kind of thing is, is, is very, very important. Uh, we offer, in, in, you know, in our storage system, we offer the ability to store both object data and metadata uh, using the same techniques, using the same dispersal techniques. So you get the benefits of reliability and availability of the data and the metadata in similar fashion. And, and what that does is it allows, uh, it, it allows essentially limitless scalability. You can scale the architecture, adding more and more uh, storage nodes and more and more locations and, and bringing more things online very seamlessly and very easily and be able to take advantage of that, that infinite scale or limitless scale, both on the object data perspective and on the metadata perspective. Now, we, we deal with customers that, you know, that, that take different approaches. I'll, I'll give you an example like Shutterfly. Shutterfly does maintain separately a metadata database and, and all the metadata associated with those photos in a separate storage tier and all the object data, the, the photo data and all the objects associated with the photos are maintained in, in you know, these large um, repositories, you know, multiple petabytes, multiple uh, you know, tens of petabytes of information captured in, in one large single repository. That's their, their approach and, they, and they've been comfortable with that approach and it gives them uh, flexibility and, and, and reliability that they're looking for for their, for their customers. But there's multiple ways to, to go about keeping track of the metadata and keeping track of the data objects. Uh, but the key, obviously, is, is ensuring that metadata is available and it's, it's usable such that you can use the actual objects. You can find them, you can retrieve them, you can recover them, you can update them as necessary, you can analyze them, which is a, a, a big piece of, of what's going on in our world today is, is the whole analytics piece. Uh, you know, being able to access that information uh, quickly and, and, and easily through through the use of metadata is very very important. Right, and and can we just spend a little more time on the performance aspects? I mean, what kind of differences um, we can use the Shutterfly example or, or or a different commercial application as an example? But the performance requirements on the metadata, I would suspect, would be substantially different in terms of latencies that you'd expect. Um, yeah. Right. Is that fair? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it certainly is, it certainly is uh, as I mentioned in their case, a, a, a different tier of storage. It's a different you know, database architecture that they're maintaining. Um, and, and 
access patterns and, and latency and, and all those kinds of things are, are architected in such a way that they can deliver the service at the time frames that they need to for their for their customers. So, and I think with most object storage systems, uh, that's, that's that's sort of the way that uh, you know that, that people take advantage of it. They 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 you know they, they use object storage systems to store objects, and they they may or may not use this, the object storage system to store the metadata. But if they need uh, you know sort of uh, like in the case of Shutterfly, rapid access, the ability to find or or, or search or locate you know an object in a in a pool of let's say 20 billion or 25 billion objects. They, they, they have a different architecture. They have a different structure in order to make that happen. Yeah, I don't know if you have visibility to this, but Shutterfly just recently made an acquisition. I'm trying to remember the name of the company. But um, it was in the content... I think, I think it's called This Life? Or yeah, This Life. That's life. right. That's right. Yeah. And, and This Life is in the content curation space, and so, right. so it goes and reads through probably all of the data that's sitting on your system then, uh, assuming that that's the way that... Uh, they're going to integrate the technologies, but read through all the data that's on your system or, or on Facebook or other, other repositories, and then actually do the, so, a fair bit of the metadata creation. Does that change the workload on your side? Uh, potentially. I, you know, again, I, I think the, the, the key that, and value proposition that we're delivering is, is you know, scalability and limitless scalability from an object storage perspective and, and being able to capture and, and store reliably and securely uh, any number of objects, whatever size and whatever capacity they may be, as they start to integrate these other, uh, you know, these other systems and, and, and objects or elements or data objects from, from other systems and they start to, to, to bring them together to, you know, to, to put together a, a, a lifespan or a, a duration of, of, of someone's life, it, it could potentially, you know, uh, drive the need for them to to certainly, you know, analyze and keep track of where things exist and where things reside, and potentially move those things, you know, into a, a CleverSafe or a, a larger object storage system uh, like CleverSafe. But you know, it, 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 it's it's still kind of I think early in, in their thought process in terms of what they want to actually, you know, how they want to actually utilize this asset and, and bring more and more of these capabilities to their customers. Right. Um, I want to uh, pause for a second and, um, and see if there are any uh, questions here in the community. We've got quite a number of people on the call. Hi, this is Bob. I had a question. Um, earlier you were talking about the performance aspects of, of, say, metadata. And I know for certain stores like Ocean Store, what they were uh, they actually advocate having cached copies of the whole object if you're looking to increase performance. Have you found or, or tried any of those and what success or, or lack of success have you had trying to do that? So Bob, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat or have John repeat because you broke up uh, during that during your question. So I, I think, and Bob, uh, um, I think the question that you asked was you're seeing people putting entire objects into the cache, is that right? Well, the, let me restate it. So okay. can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that's better. Okay. All right. Sorry. So um, when you're using EC, the, the sort of attendant problem that comes with that is that the performance, the latency is increased. And I've seen that in two implementations mm -hmm. when I was at EMC. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the, the question is, well, how do you increase performance then? And in, in some of the papers, such as for Ocean Store, what they recommend is having local cache copies of objects is a way to decrease latency time. Uh, I was wondering if you had tried that in, in, in a real-world implementation and seen if uh, that was worth it, not worth it, et cetera. Uh, so yes, that that is a, a method or a, a way to go after you know sort of the uh, the latency problem and, and and yes there is there is additional overhead associated with erasure coding uh, when it comes to you know putting putting all the pieces back together and delivering you know the final object there is there's you know, calculations that have to happen in order to, to put the information back together which which does increase the overhead uh, we CleverSafe have not uh, have not delivered a solution along those lines, although we've done some prototyping and we think there are some, some, some ways to take advantage of 
you know, uh, a, a caching mechanism sitting in front of a large object store that that can that can deliver the you know the the, the high performance or, or high throughput uh, kind of results that, that that certain use cases or certain models uh, uh, require. Uh, I'm not aware of any other uh, erasure coding companies that have that have necessarily uh, introduced products or techniques that, that can do that. Certainly. It, it is something that we uh, we are uh, uh, working with in the labs and, and playing with in, in our own uh, uh, development efforts, but it's not something that, that I'm aware of that you know, exists as a as a uh, commercially available product at this point. I see. Thanks a lot. This is uh, this is Kyle. I've got a question about uh, basically down market. For, for everything you talked about, this is really an enterprise or a very large content focused company uh, or organization type scenario. What kind of lessons learned are there for potential future SMB bid marketplace or decisions that are made? Um, is there anything that's applicable to that space um, with regard to uh, with regard to what's happening with hyperscale storage? Did you hear that, yeah, Russ? Um, so yeah, the I, the, I the, the, the pieces the, of that one as well, John. If you could repeat or have somebody yeah. repeat. Yes, yeah, so sir. The the uh, the question really was. So, so we've talked about scaling up, but there's two dimensions. Scott is, I know Scott Lowe has talked about scaling up and scaling down. Is there a dimension to your technology that says, okay, somebody who only has a petabyte should really go this way, or only has, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of petabytes of storage should go this way? Does that make sense? Well, so uh, I, I think I, I understand the, the gist of the question, and, and, and really, you know, where where I think uh, you know things are things are going with respect to this technology and, and approach is certainly, you know, people that are at a petabyte or tens of petabytes today understand the pain and understand the challenge that, that traditional approaches uh, bring to 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 bear. Others that are less than that, if they if they potentially could grow to that level, I mean, uh, we, we're dealing with companies. Uh, all the time that are, you know, their their full-on data capacity is in the tens of or hundreds of terabytes, but yet they're growing so rapidly that they'll be at a petabyte very quickly and be at two petabytes, you know, very quickly beyond that. So they they're certainly, you know, looking to um, you know, future-proof their their storage infrastructure and look at ways that they can you know, get to a capacity easily and grow with that capacity very easily. The other method that I think is is, is starting to become popular is you know using uh, storage services or storage as a service or using service providers that provide storage as a service for organizations that you know are say less than that um, you know that capacity that petabyte level of capacity uh, you know they can offer certainly uh, you know a lot of capabilities a lot of, uh, uh, of reliability and availability of, of, of data uh, but you're 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 now uh, you know giving your information to a third party, to a service provider, and, you know, and expecting that they will protect it and that, you know, they'll ensure that it's available, those kinds of things. So there's, there's trade-offs with that, with that model as well, but I think a lot of organizations that are you know, certainly below that capacity and, 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 and want to use services that are out there uh, can, can take advantage of, of you know, all the different offerings that are there, and, and you know, if they do, uh, continue to grow to a certain level, they may want to look at bringing it back in house at some point in time. Right. Russ, do you have um, service providers who are leveraging your technology to deliver a cloud service? Uh, so we are not a service provider. Uh, right. We, we, we do uh, offer our technology to other service providers, and we do have some customers in the service provider space that, that are, you know, Housing the, the infrastructure and providing services to end clients and customers. We have we have both commercial customers in that space and uh, federal integrators that, that provide that service to uh, federal agencies as well. Um, and I think that that you know that that bodes well for you know the, the question that was being asked, and that is, you know, are there different approaches versus just acquiring hardware or acquiring a system uh, to to gaining the benefit of you know, dispersal and erasure coding from a reliability and a cost perspective, and certainly there are service providers that are out there that are looking at providing these kinds of uh, uh, approaches and capabilities for their customers. We're, we're not going to be in that market. We're, we're a, a technology uh, company. We build uh, systems. We build 
uh, you know, software capabilities, but, but there are certainly organizations out there that want to uh, provide services for their clients and their customers and are looking at technologies like ours to that. So what do people think, this is Dave Vellante, what do people think happens to the enterprise hardware business as we know it? So you've got uh, Intel's OEMs on the server side, you know, HP, Dell, Cisco, certainly to a lesser extent IBM. I mean, IBM's got an x86 business, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I guess Oracle as well, or they're kind of a wild card. And then the, the storage side, you know, add, add to the, those names EMC and, and NetApp and I guess Hitachi, but certainly IBM and HP. So we talked earlier about hyperscale being a harbinger for the future of the data center. We talked about hyperscale being essentially commodity components on which you're running software services. So, so what happens to Intel's, all Intel's OEMs and Seagate's OEMs? I mean, essentially the server vendors have been marking up Intel microprocessors for years, and the, the, uh, the storage vendors that sell into the enterprise have been marking up Seagate disk drives for years. Um, that dynamic seems to be, I guess we're predicting that's going to change in some way, shape, or form. Um, what do people think about that? I don't know, Russ, if you have an opinion, uh, uh, does, you know, do the big server vendors have to figure out how to play in this market or get marginalized? How do they play? Oh, I think they are starting to play in the market. I mean, it, it, you look at, you know, what EMC is doing, uh, you know, first with the acquisition of Isilon and now with, you know, uh, some of the focus on, on Atmos. Uh, you look at what HP's doing. Uh, you know, you look at you look at all those you know, major players out there, and I think they're they're starting to realize that the market is going in this direction, and they need to start making uh, you know investments, and they need to start you know, building capabilities in order to deliver those kinds of services to their customers. Now, I, I don't think that that this this approach or this kind of technique is necessarily uh, applicable to all applications and to all uses of storage. I mean, there are certainly, uh, you know, tier one type applications and tier one storage solutions that are not necessarily going to, to run very well on a dispersed system, nor necessarily going to be uh, put on a, you know, a, a commodity oriented storage device or server device. So, uh, you know, their, their businesses in that respect will continue to, uh, you know, to be maintained, I would expect. However, if you look at the growth and you look at where you know the the new data is coming from and you look at you know all the fact that that a lot of the different uh, you know uh, objects and images and, and types of data that people are capturing and want to use and collaborate with et cetera et cetera they, they do definitely have to evolve their offerings and be able to uh, you know to to bring to the marketplace storage solutions that they can they can deliver at the price point, and the scalability points, and the, and, and and you know the reliability and availability that we're talking about, uh, you know, so that they can compete, so they won't be marginalized. So, but today their their intellectual property is is highly or intrinsically linked to the hardware, but oftentimes in custom ASICs, um, or, or certainly in software that they either bundle in or 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 sell with uh, their hardware. Um, uh, who, do we? Do we see examples of these traditional companies that are in good positions to, to take advantage of this trend? What, what do people think? Well, so, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I think that they, they realize that there are, you know, trends in the market and, and, and movements afoot in the market that are going to drive a lot more usage in this area. Uh, and so they are. Uh, they're partnering with other uh, companies. They're partnering with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, uh, you know, like the likes of, of uh, disk drive providers and, and, and server providers and software providers such as our, us to to deliver solutions that meet the requirements that, that we're talking about. I agree with you. I mean, I, I think a lot of the investment that they've made, you know, uh, up until this point is in customized hardware and very customized software solutions, et cetera. But those won't, as we talked about earlier, those won't necessarily translate into this type of use case and this type of scale. So they're, they're going to have to look at uh, options and other ways to, to bring technologies to, uh, to the marketplace that will address those needs. And certainly they're looking at either partnerships or in some cases acquisition uh, to acquire a, a, a capability or a technology that will allow them to, to bring those kinds of solutions. 
So John, we've heard uh, some companies talking about you know, abstracting or extracting the software and, and actually selling that separate from the hardware. Do you, do you, sure. do you, do you see, uh, John, the, the co companies in a position to do that? I mean, you, you've been working with these companies for years. You were a customer of theirs. Are they in a position to do that in your view? You know, it's, it, I think one of the things that's really difficult is the transition. Um, and some of it's, it's just the transition in the business model. Right, so if you if you're going from a, a business model, model where you're selling, you know, very high revenue, you know, high dollar amount uh, hardware, with a different margin model, but uh, immediate revenue recognition to a software business model or a services business model, it's it's quite gut wrenching in terms of, you know, how how you how how the public market reacts to it. So, you know, we, um, I think the recent uh, move uh, potential of Dell to go private as they go through a transition what's going to probably be a pretty gut-wrenching transition at Dell is, is a maybe a, a harbinger of what some of the large enterprise companies need to do if they're going to make if they're going to successfully make that switch well I mean it's a, it's a complicated yeah. switch uh, 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 let me just say this and then I'll let somebody jump in I mean let's say I'm selling a, a, a box today right. for whether it's a million dollars half a million dollars three hundred thousand two hundred thousand right. all of a sudden I'm gonna sell this package, so this software, software package for a couple of hundred thousand, two hundred, three, four, five hundred, a million. Right. Uh, I, I could see it's some a serious customer backlash there. Well, right. wait a minute. What yeah. am I paying for? I, 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 that's a different mindset. Somebody else had a comment? Yeah. This is David Fine. I, I, uh, I w would like to perhaps uh, uh, comment that the opportunity for vendors is, is not all uh, lower cost. Um, the model is that everything is going to be paid for up front of the hardware, and it'll actually you, you, what they want or what what they will want to do with the business case for providing that hardware is that you eliminate all the maintenance, so you you don't provide that maintenance, and you don't and the customer doesn't have to provide that maintenance, and you have it there for a shorter period of time and then replace it. So there are some upsides to vendors who embrace this. Uh, there's uh, uh, you know con continual replacement uh, over a longer uh, over a longer cycle, and uh, and and uh, the saving of operational costs will be huge, uh, which will justify actually maybe slightly higher uh, capital costs uh, going in. Um, so so th th there's a and, and in the case of Dell, of course, there is a specific reason why they will have a very significant reduction in revenue because of uh, the uh, reduction in the number of PCs being sold uh, by them well, uh, and, and other vendors. Well, sure, and that's the PC sort of tablet yeah. shift going on. But how about Cisco? I mean, that's a classic case where you've got a company that has a lot of, you know, has been great with proprietary hardware and custom ASICs and the like, and now this trend called SDN comes in, right? right? And now uh, they're talking a good game, uh, but what happens to Cisco? I mean, I wish Stu were on to answer this question, but any other Cisco pundits um, out there, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it, it, the, the Cisco sell uh, great boxes. They're integrated, and, um, uh, but they're, in, in, they're much more expensive than they would, would be if the other model was taken. But however, if they embrace it, uh, if they embrace it, um, and sell uh, uh, boxes which require no maintenance and which at the end of the day will you know, be replaced in three years' time or four years' time, uh, there's no reason why they couldn't be uh, very successful uh, in that m model. Yeah. It's, it's going to need uh, a great deal of courage to, uh, to, to, to switch to it, as John was saying. But I, I think so, they can be successful and yeah. sell, sell the software separately. So David, right. David, we did a quick switcheroo yeah, here. And so so, so this is Stu. So there's two pieces. Of course, SDN is looking to kind of abstract the control plane. Um, and then there's a discussion of the commoditization of, of the hardware itself because uh, you know, Cisco and everybody else is working on SDN. They're going to have you know, open flow controllers. They're going to uh, you know, take that piece out of it. Um, but if you look at what was discussed at the open compute discussion, it's the hyperscale guys and what differentiates them is what you said, David, is I want the simplest components as possible. I want bare bones. I'm, I'm not going to buy them from somebody that puts together the solution that has 
you know, 500 features. Uh, I'm going to buy something that is, uh, you know, very simple. It's based on a chipset. Um, things like the ODMs. If you looked at uh, what Facebook announced with OCP, uh, one of the suppliers they had, it was Intel, and it was Quanta Computer. Well, Quanta is the same company that's putting together just bare bone switches built with like Broadcom chipsets. So a, a order of magnitude cheaper on what they can do. And if we can take the software and, ex and extract that out, I can still use a Cisco switch or I can buy a switch that's much, much cheaper than that. And so that is the potential to, to truly disrupt, you know, Cisco and some of the other legacy guys who were all trying to pivot to to uh, really taking their software, bundling that, and making that the source of value. Russ, is that consistent with what you're seeing from your customers and in, in your yeah, sector? I, I was just going to say, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the thing that that we hear all the time is, is is customers want you know at this scale, they certainly want to and they want a platform that that you know delivers a certain capability from a hardware perspective. But the real the real benefit or value that they're looking for from companies like ours is is the guaranteed levels of availability and reliability that our software can provide. And, you know, they're going to very commodity-oriented, you know, componentry. Uh, a similar example that, you know, in the storage industry is using desktop-class hard drives versus, you know, cloud or enterprise-class hard drives, which are a lot cheaper. And if you can deliver the levels of reliability and availability uh, using software sitting on top of that, that commodity-oriented hardware, that desktop-class-oriented hardware, that that's the same or equivalent to an enterprise that's you know twice as much. Certainly, you're going to want to go with the lower cost, especially at that scale. So, absolutely, the parallels are are, are similar from a you know from what you were describing from a networking perspective and a storage perspective. So, is that how you go to market, Russ? Is a software solution, or or you offer both? Or we're, we're very we're very flexible from a customer perspective. We we offer. Uh, commodity-oriented hardware platforms as appliances with our software on them. We also offer our software uh, that we can integrate with whatever hardware platform that the customer wants to use, and we've done that in, on a number of occasions. We've, we've worked with other OEMs, we've worked with other you know, major and, and, and minor suppliers. As long as it meets a certain specification in terms of you know, CPU and, and interface, network interface, and, and, and drive capacity, we can generally make it work with our software, and, and so we, we offer a very flexible approach. So it's really software the way you want it, <laughs> and and the customer gets to pick, sort of, right? Correct. Yeah. So because we're certainly seeing, uh, I mean, we've we've had a number of guests on recently who are delivering you know converged infrastructure that's got embedded software, it's got embedded custom ASICs or FPGAs or uh, um, uh, for to accelerate certain parts of the workload. I'm um, thinking of, of, of some of the backup uh, backup replication uh, dedupe um, appliance sure. suppliers, right, sure. that are out there. Right. There's the, a couple of them locally here. So, um. no, I, I, I mean, I, I, again, as, as, as we, we talked earlier, I think there are certain certain applications and certainly certain use cases that are going to demand or drive a specific or very proprietary oriented solution, but for this. Hyperscale for the data that we're talking about, the the the, uh, you know, the video, the audio, the large unstructured object that's going to be written once, read you know quite a bit of times, like uh, like the use case that was discussed earlier, or something that's going to be more or less an active archive. It's data that's going to be saved. It's going to be available for essentially forever. Uh, you know, like somebody's photos at Shutterfly. The oriented hardware is, is a very good solution for that kind of approach. And with software like ours layered on top of it, you can deliver levels of reliability that are, you know, that you, you used to have to pay quite a premium for. You no longer have to do that. I, I am intrigued, and maybe this is a follow up for a, a, a later conversation, but I am intrigued by this notion of having created a large repository that, that was a, you know, store once, read occasionally. Um, uh, kind of um, repository, but then you come along with some of this uh, metadata creation, content curation um, solution, which all of a sudden goes through and reads the entire repository at once, right? So I just, I, I wonder how they deal with that and do they have to migrate that repository for the curation process or it becomes a background task or what? Do you know? Well, so 
uh, I can give you a real life example. Right. Uh, it, it's not the it's not the this life example, but but earlier or actually last year, uh, uh, Shutterfly acquired the assets from Kodak Kodak Gallery, Kodak O Photo, or Kodak right, Gallery. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and they did the very same thing, right? They they migrated all of those assets from one repository to the Shutterfly repository, which is based on, on which is Shutterfly. on you, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And as they were doing that migration, they obviously, uh, you know, tag all those components and all those images with, you know, the metadata that was necessary for them to be able to offer those services now to, uh, you know, the Kodak customers. And, and that was a very straightforward, seamless process that, you know, their application was able to, to handle. And they did it all. I mean, I think they, they, they migrated about 12 petabytes, maybe 15 petabytes of data in about a month's time frame. And then uh, actually, once it was live and online, they actually moved part of it at a time from one location to another location. So once it came online, it was always available, uh, but they were able to migrate the entire platform and the entire repository from one location to another by just keeping enough of it up and available and online uh, if someone wanted to recall or use or, or you know, take advantage of that. Uh, an image that was out there, it was still available. And that's, those, those are kind of interesting use cases if you think about it, you know, that, that technologies like erasure coding and dispersal provide. Uh, you, can, you can actually pick up and move an entire uh, storage system without ever taking it. Without doing what? Without ever taking it offline. It's always available. And that's you know, huge. You can still get to the data. Right. I, th I think um, that's, a, that's a huge benefit uh, when you... Uh, when you start to think about these repositories, because you, you can't back them up anymore, you, right. it's really difficult to replicate them, and it's nearly impossible to to migrate them if you're on any kind of traditional architecture, right? Um, right. Uh, it, can you? I mean, it used to be that you put all that data on tape, and then you you know you cover from you know from tape in another location. It's too much data anymore to, to to be able to do that in a reasonable period of time. So if you have to move it, or if you want to, let's say. You know, a very valid use case for us is what we call start start locally and then expand geographically. So customers start with a, a local repository in one location, and then as they want to start to take advantage of sort of high availability and site availability, they'll move parts of the system to another location and parts of the system to a third location. You ready, man? You ready? Never take That's a very valid use case for us. Um, so, uh, help me again with the sweet spot for you guys with respect to response time. Um, uh, we've had we've had um, uh, end users on that are looking for, you know, 100 millisecond kind of response time. This weekend, I or this last week, I uh, I spent time who were looking for with with some folks who were looking for microsecond response time, um, uh, and um, uh, be, because because the difference between a couple of microseconds um, affects whether or not they get the trade or not. You know, so, um, so in your world, what's the, what's the kind of response time in terms of retrieving an object that, that you're looking to serve? Uh, to us, the, the, the most important thing is time to first bite, right? Because we're yep. generally dealing with you know, a, a large object that's going to be streamed over, you know, some period of time and, and, and getting to that first biting, starting that retrieval process and, and, and whatnot is, is the most important. Uh, and obviously, as, as was discussed earlier, there is a bit of overhead associated with, you know, taking pieces of an object, putting them back together, recalculating, going through that calculation and delivering it back out to the application or to right. the user. Uh, you know, processors today do that very, very fast. It's, it used to be that that was a you know, an onerous process and CPUs were not fast enough to do that very well. That's not the case today. I mean, the latest processors from companies like Intel and AMD and, and, and others do that do that transaction or that calculation very, very fast. So yep. for us, it, you know, the, the key to delivering a, a response time that is that is adequate for the application is the speed of the network, how much bandwidth right. is available from the access point to the, you know, to the data uh, storage repositories or the data stores that are, we call them slice stores. They're actually the storage nodes that, that okay. have the pieces of the data. So that, that uh, you know, speed of that network, the latency associated with that, the, the packet loss associated with that, so how clean is the network? You know, so it, there's not a whole lot of retries. If that's a very clean network, then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's reasonable to assume 
in a in a very you know valid use case that you can get you know uh, like you said 100 millisecond 200 millisecond response time even geographically dispersed as long as you have enough bandwidth and your packet loss is is not that great. Okay, that that that, hel that helps a lot. Um, you know, we we had some folks on talking about ad, the ad serving uh, or ad yeah. bidding market recently, and you know that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, so again, there's certain use cases where you know th this kind of technology is not a good fit. But again, if, if, if time to first byte is your measurement, and then from there it's it's streaming an object or, or recovering a, an entire object that maybe you say a few megabytes in size, or even a few gigabytes, or even a few terabytes in size, you know that. That, right. that process is, is generally pretty straightforward once you get to the first byte. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, the similarities in the two use cases, um, very different applications and very different technology, but the similarities in the use cases are that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't influence that impacts end user experience, right? Yes. Right. Yes. But your part, you can do very cost effectively um, and, and very quickly, given the direction that with, the trend, with the technology. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I think we got time maybe for one last round of question or um, so. Yep. Anyone else uh, open up? Okay. Dave, any last questions from you? No. I just. Um, I guess my uh, my comments and observations. I really do think that uh, this discussion hits on the sea change that's coming, and I think that. You know, the hyperscale weaving into things that we've been talking around uh, about around software-led infrastructure and obviously the data explosion are all kind of weaving together to, to really, you know, we've been talking about these. You could see it coming for, for years now, almost a decade, watching what Google and Amazon and Facebook have been doing. But now we're starting to actually see this bleed into the enterprise and commercial products, and I think it is going to have a ripple effect. And I'm just, it's fascinating times, and uh, appreciate everybody uh, coming to the call today. Yeah, and um, and I, what I what I one of my takeaways from this is that there is, uh, uh, it's absolutely necessary for the technology suppliers to be able to deliver technology the way the customer wants to consume it, whether it's a cloud service or it's a as a transaction I was involved in recently where they they uh, the the buyer uh, basically jobs out everything from the disk drives to the processors to the to the to the to the uh, servers and uh, does their own system integration. So I think we're you know we're going to see a lot of different models go. But it um, but I think uh, uh, the uh, erasure encoding data dispersal techniques fit a fit a real need for a growing uh, uh, requirement within enterprises of all sizes. And the question is when is it going to hit uh, a, a broad market? But uh, it's it's definitely coming. So. Thank you very much for joining us here today on uh, the uh, January 22nd uh, uh, Peer Insights. Uh, Russ Kennedy uh, from Cleversafe, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks also, we had uh, questions from Scott Lowe and, uh, and David Floyer. And Bob. Uh, and, and Bob, whoever you are, Bob, thank you. Oh, yeah, Bob Primer. Oh, Bob Primer, thank you, Bob. <laughs> You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, we will uh, be writing research notes over the next couple of days. Get them up on uh, on wikibon.org. Please feel free to uh, jump in, contribute, edit, improve, enhance. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to sign off now. And uh, thanks very much for being with us today.